check. Uh, if we can reconvene our meeting to open session, the board has been in executive session since 6 o'clock uh, to discuss a student disciplinary matter. Um, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Introductions. Dave Hurst. John Walston. Catherine Natto. Meredith Moriarty. Jody Monroe. Holly Dellenbaugh. Christine Beck. Robert Tejan. Willow Bear. John McPhillips. Uh, first up, uh, oh, first, um, do we have any pig students with us tonight? Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, your obligation is to stay until 9 o'clock or when the meeting is over, whichever one comes first. Um, and when you guys leave, there are or we will have, if we don't already have them, um, there's some sign out sheets for you guys to sign out just to make sure you get credit for being here, okay? Uh, first is the approval of minutes. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the minutes from the April 5th, 2023 regular board meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. Item three, meeting reports. Uh, first is our superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, yesterday, our SROs, Mike Bourbon and Caitlin Craigie, um, and I all attended a joint meeting with area superintendents, school resource officers, representatives from the state police and the FBI to uh, learn and discuss more about the recent swatting incidences yeah. that have been happening to schools. Uh, it was a great presentation. The FBI presented how these are occurring and multiple levels. Uh, the data is important for schools to preserve and also the roles that everyone plays uh, to address these disruptions for our student staff and families as well as local communities. So uh, we will continue having some ongoing conversations about how to best address those to prevent disruptions. But I thought it was, it's the first time we've had a meeting like that. I thought it was very productive. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Jen Spiela, I see in the back there. She is on the agenda tonight for appointment to the Director of Student Services. Uh, she'll be replacing Kathy Johnston, who's retiring at the end of the school year. Uh, this position is a bit different from the current role where the director will not only oversee special education, but they will also supervise our counseling services and our multi-tier system of services um, instructional support programs. 
Uh, the shift to this new position will hopefully bridge the gap between special education and intervention services, ultimately best meeting the needs of all of our students. So I'd like to recognize Jen. I don't know, Jen, if you have anything you'd like to say at this time? You don't have to, but you're welcome to <laughs> come up and say something if you'd like. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Can you? Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank the board um, for this wonderful opportunity. I'm so excited and I'm honored to be selected to be filling this role. And I, I can't wait to jump right in, although I know not until July 1st, but <laughs> I will be um, just so excited and I'm honored. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and that's all I have if anyone has any questions. Any questions for Jody? <laughs> I'm going to stand and approach the mic. Um, so you had said that the, that the position will oversee counseling, MTSS, and there was a third one. Special ed. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then could you just speak for anybody who's not following this quite as closely, um, any, you know, any, any plans or any kind of additional shifts that you, that you could foresee coming as a result of bringing all of these under the same umbrella um, and just give a bit of background on that? So the, the assistant directors that are currently in place uh, for MTSS, special education and counseling will still remain the same. Uh, the CSE chairs will still kind of follow underneath the, direct, the assistant director of special ed. So I think the real benefit is that currently um, there's not that direct connection between intervention services um, aligning and making sure that we're um, doing everything we should be doing prior to any referral to special education. So it really improves communication. There's a continuum of um, services that students can get prior to needing any special education services. So I'm hoping that we started to do that uh, a little more this year with really the development under uh, Jen's leadership with MTSS. So I think that will just continue to grow. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next is our board report. Um, and I just quickly wanted to say that I look forward to the Eagle Challenge that is coming up. Um, look forward to participating and volunteering at it. Um, and I hope to see a lot of people there. Anybody have anything else that they want to share? I feel like it's with the break in the middle. There hasn't been that much going on. Okay. Uh, next are our um, student reports. Do we have anyone from the Student Senate? Hello, good evening. I'm Elizabeth Baldwin, the president of the High School Student Senate. And in Student Senate, we don't have much to report that's different than last week, but last week I talked about how Student Senate is sponsoring one leg of the Eagle Challenge. And at that leg, there will be a lot of different um, first responder vehicles, like fire trucks. There'll be one of those really big horses that the <laughs> police have. And we're encouraging kids and families to come to, get, to see these vehicles and see the insides of them, and if you're lucky, you could play on one. We were trying to get one of those cool cranes for everyone to see. And so we encourage students and families to come and hang out and get to know them, as well as go to other legs of the Eagle Challenge. I know that there is live music on Friday evening by a lot of our high school students. And so yeah, we're all looking forward to it. Thank you. Do you know what time the leg is that the... Oh, yes. The big truck event that I Student Senate is sponsoring is 12 to 4, um, so noon to 4 p.m. on Saturday. On Saturday. Thank you. Okay. Just in case we have any interest, interested truck enthusiasts with us tonight. Um, do we have anyone from the middle school? And do we have any friends from Slingerlands here with us tonight? <laughs>
um, our school has done some our class has done some amazing activities so far this year. We had a classroom trial to determine whether Columbus Day should be a national holiday. Some parents and teachers participated. We also had a wax museum where we dressed up as famous historical figures and told people our accomplishment. Currently, we're working on an argument essay and researching the pros and cons of iReady. We even interviewed the CEO of curriculum associate and ask if and how I ready will be improved for English language learners. Thanks. Hi, my name is Priscilla. This spring, we're, this spring there are many fun and exciting activities taking place here at Sandals. On May 10th, the school will have the Scholastic Book Fair and the Around the World Cultural Fair. For the Cultural Fair, families are invited to share examples of their culture, customs, and traditions. Did you know that our school has a school newspaper? It is called the Soaring Eagle, and there have been two issues published so far this year. We are putting out a third issue later this month. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zelda. Some of the third grade classes are doing a country's project. Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Brock. We are researching a different country on the following topics: landforms and climate, people, history and customs. We also make made titles for our country books. We are doing the research using Pebble Go, World with Kids and more. The final project will consist of a book made on the computer using Google Slides. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kubra. This year, we have done a lot of fun activities in PE class, such as gymnastics, Scooter City, and Field Day at the end of the year. The Science fair was held on March 2nd. Over 100 students participate. My project was a bouncing egg. I got a ball, then I put the egg inside a ball, then I filled it with vinegar, and I waited one day, and I feel, peeled the shell off, and it became a bouncing egg. Our school started a recycling and compost program at lunch. Students empty recyclables in the recycle bin. Students toss all left, leftover food in the compost bin. We, we are hoping this will help the environment and make everyone our Aware of what we throw out every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, students. You guys did an amazing, amazing job. So really well done. And that's that's it for our student purpose level. Thank you so much. I think they're all up here. I, I think you guys should send some of those I Ready essays to uh, Dr. Hurst when you're done. Holly, too. Part of the plan. Okay, that's part of yeah, you guys can come on up here. I have a, a special pin for you. Mr. Baker, maybe uh, when you're done with your next edition of the newspaper, you can send copies over for the board. It is. I have a copy here, which I can. 
So thank you guys for coming. You are more than welcome to stay, but if you would like to go home, you can do that also. <laughs> Uh, next on our agenda tonight um, are presentations. And our first presentation is a bond project update. And I don't know if you want to wait just one minute while our friends leave. Tonight's presentation is an update of the 2021 Capital Bond Project. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to introduce uh, a couple of members of our project team. Drew Jones from Ashton McGraw Ar Architects, Mike Collins from uh, Turner Construction Company, who is our construction manager, and Brian Bodner from Operations and Maintenance. Um, we have some good news that uh, the district has finally received full state education department approval for all elements of the project um, last Tuesday, or Tuesday the 11th. Um, after an eight-month review period. Um, I'll summarize the project status and the recommended actions needed to begin construction in the next few slides. So just to recap that the, uh, the total uh, referendum was a, approximately $40.7 million with uh, about 200 scope elements. Um, the project total would uh, benefit all buildings across the district and it supports our district mission and four, four goal areas of academics, character, character, community, and wellness. And again, there was no uh, impact on taxes for the residents. Um, update from last fall, October board meeting. So in October 22, prior to the project submission to State Education Department for review and approval, um, the construction manager completed a construction estimate the result in, an in the project being over approximately $10.2 million, or 20%. Um, with the goal in mind to maximize the amount of work included and have an awardable project once bids were received, we utilized some reduction strategies at that time, um, value engineering elements that operations and maintenance could do, uh, lower priority um, reductions for, for uh, low priority project elements. For example, um, you know, some masonry repair. It was a lower priority and wasn't required this time. And some building envelope portions of the project. Um, back in the fall, that resulted in about 69 scope elements being reduced and brought the SCD submission estimate to within budget. Um, just a, a quick revision now that we do have State Education Department approval um, uh, bids were received on March 15th. Um, if, as we all remember, we had a nice snowstorm on March 14th, so uh, we delayed it one day and received bids on the 15th. Um, this evening, we're looking uh, for approval to award the con contracts um, for the uh, approved bidders. And if we are approved, construction will begin as soon as next week. Uh, the goal is to complete the project or continue to try to meet the late fall 2024 uh, completion date. However, um, we are reviewing the schedule right now to ensure that we can accomplish that. So we did receive the public bids on um, March 15th. Uh, we solicited, solicited bids for six prime contractors, uh, those being general construction or GC, site contractor, roofing, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical contractors. Um, we only received one bid for the general construction, roofing, and plumbing contractors, um, which is not favorable for the district because that was less competition and our bids may have been a little bit higher. <clears throat> so these are the bid details. And as we look at this chart, you can see that uh, on the left side of it was our budget that 
we estimated we should carry for this portion of the construction. So the general uh, contractor was 9.6. I won't read them all to you, but total in sum, they were 23, approximately 23 million 972 is what we expected our bids to come in at. The actual bids, which is the center of the chart, were $29,185,999. All right, that resulted in a budget gap, not in our favor, of approximately $5.2 million. All right, um, so immediately uh, the team began what we call qualifying and vetting the, the, the bids to make sure that they didn't carry something they shouldn't have or did carry something that they shouldn't have. So that way. All right. Um, Immediately, we were able to reduce our construction contingency from 7.5% down to 5%. Um, we were able to do that because with the 69 element reductions and the proposals this evening, the team felt comfortable in doing that because we've removed enough scope that we wouldn't need to carry that many dollars. All right. Um, I just wanted to, for those that don't recall, um, you know, there's three portions of our, our budget, one being the construction or the hard costs what it actually takes to get the work done, our incidental costs, which would be architect, construction manager fees, uh, furniture, um, equipment, things like that. And our contingency would be for the unknowns, the unforeseen. An example would be when we get into construction, we could have a pipe behind the wall that may have hazardous material that was not expected. So that was our contingency. All right, so we're comfortable reducing that. And what that did is it reduced our overage or our gap by uh, about $1.4 million, leaving a resulting 3.771,131 over budget without doing anything further. All right. Um, <clears throat> the reasons that the bids were over budget, um, so we had we are still experiencing our supply chain, workforce issues, and inflation. It's not going down at this moment. It's either remaining flat or going up. Um, our escalation, and, and, and recall that we did start this estimating process back in 2019, so three years have passed. Um, with our inflation and our escalation, it, it's, it's uh, not favorable to the district to be uh, in this position with bidding. Um, so our escalation factor was greater than anticipated. Um, so industry standard is about 1% per month in escalation. Uh, mechanical equipment alone increased 25% since December of 22. And roofing and specialty ceiling systems outpaced the escalation factor that we used as well. Um, another reason is we are out to bid later than anticipated. Um, we submitted our uh, project to State Education Department back in August, okay, and we just received uh, SCD approval in, on April 11th. So instead of 12 to 14 week review process, it, it took eight months. So a lot of uh, uh, folks are out to bid ahead of us, and there's a lot of construction in the area, which leads into market saturation. Um, in a nutshell, what that means is there's too much work and not enough contractors in the capital region. All right, um, three, and, and again, three of the six prime contracts only had one bidder. That shows that we didn't have a lot of folks bidding on our project, and it was a less competitive uh, market for us. Um, you know, some of the uh, market saturation, a study was done by the construction manager, and I don't want to go into detail, but there's uh, some major projects coming up. Not necessarily schools, but Albany Airport has a large project. Albany Charter Schools, Cohoes, Lansingburg, Gloversville, Skodak, Mechanicville, Duanesburg, Bird Hills, North Colony, et cetera, are all doing construction work in the capital region. Um, and not to mention Gilded and Glens Falls and Queensbury that are, they, they, they were just ahead of us. Okay. Um, I'm gonna just, I wanna expand a little bit about that, um, about how Bethlehem came in. We're approximately 12% over budget when we received bids. Um, that's not the fall. We were 20% over budget in the fall of 22 before we made some reductions. So Bethlehem was at 12% uh, uh, over budget after receiving bids. Uh, local school district had a $30 million project, uh, just a little smaller than ours. 
they came in at 28% over budget, and um, they too had a single uh, bid for their plumber, one of the prime contractors. Um, another local had a $14 million project. They were 8% over bid of what they projected. And again, they as well had a single uh, plumbing bid. The strategies that those districts used locally were similar to what we're recommending here this evening. Um, one was finding other funding. One of them were able to use uh, funds that they had secured for future phases of their project and they reallocated that. They reduced their con contingency as well and they had post-bid scope reductions similar to, to the recommendations for Bethlehem. And that was the same for both of these local school districts. So the project team met several times to review our options after we received our bids. All right, um, obviously, there's only a couple of things that we can do. And we looked at uh, two of our options, or only had two options. One was to reduce the scope of work so that we meet budget and we can do an award, or excuse me, so we could award the project, or we could reject all bids and rebid the project at a later date. Those were our two options. Um, our recommendation to district administration at the time was to use option one, which is uh, reduce the scope of work so that we meet budget. We did a study and determined that um, if we didn't um, reduce our scope now, we would be putting ourselves at severe risk in the future. Uh, the market saturation, we may not get any bids if we held off and we don't know what the future holds. The escalation will continue to rise and we would be facing that um, um, cost in the future. Um, so we didn't know if we were gonna get better or get worse. And, and that was a risk that we felt comfortable not making. Okay, next slide. So we had a, our reduction solution strategy for this uh, post bid was to um, one, identify a identify a few larger project elements. Again, we started out with around 200. We pared it down by 69 in the fall, and we feel that if we picked a few larger elements that we could uh, reduce the impact overall to the community, the, the school community. Um, what I mean by elements, each one has a line item. So we could say, uh, you know, replace that curtain, refinish this floor, okay? We, we don't wanna, not do the curtain and the floor, so let's pick a project to where it's only gonna affect one area. That was a really bad analogy because I used two things in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> Just realize that. But, but my point was, if we took a whole bunch of smaller elements away, we'd have to take this many, and you'll see this in a, in a slide, to achieve the same budget gap reduction, okay? So we felt that if we identify a few of the larger project elements, it would lessen the overall impact to the entire district. And we'll get into that in a, in a minute. Um, so the other uh, strategy was to rebid one of the larger elements in the fall using uh, capital reserve funding to complete the work. Um, and we will talk about that as well, but we'll have to use, the capital reserve would require voter, voter approval and depending on what happens this evening, we, we could make that happen uh, and get the process started. Um, we reviewed the construction and incidental sides of the budget for any reductions that we could find, and we identified additional value engineering items that we could incorporate some savings. So <clears throat> option one on this pie chart, I just want to do some explanation here. Option one is just as I said, select 23 smaller elements plus the alternates that were part of the bid package because we were over budget, so we certainly couldn't accept the alternates. Um, so it ends up being 28 project elements being reduced. Um, or option two, select four larger elements, and as you can see by the pie chart, the blue is what we would keep, within, keep in the project. The green is what we had to reduce back in the fall, and the orange is what we would have to reduce now. So um, option one shows we're reducing a lot more work in multiple areas versus the nine if we chose just four larger elements. Um, so I just wanna talk quickly, I don't wanna go line by line, but um, these 23 smaller elements, uh, the board has the uh, documentation to review, but 
An example of that would be at Glenmont, we would have to reduce stormwater, masonry repairs, window treatments, gym wall pads, the floors, the boilers, which is a, a, a significant uh, reduction. At Hammer Grill, we would have to remove the doors and boilers, slingerlands, window repairs, doors, cafeteria uh, HVAC and domestic water line uh, uh, work. At the middle school, we would have to reduce the tennis courts, the field work, the fencing, um, EFIS, which is the exterior envelope um, repairs, and window repairs. At the high school, we would have to uh, reduce tennis courts, stadium pavilion, cafeteria pavilion, kitchen plumbing, fire alarm replacement, and our main server room uh, air conditioning. And then at transportation, we would have to uh, limit our bus charging infrastructure to uh, the primary service, the transformer, and only two charging stations, enough to support what we have, would have been the recommendation. Okay, and then at operation and maintenance, um, there's electrical panel upgrades that would have to be removed. Option two would be removing just four large elements, um, and in that would be the middle school auditorium which we would recommend that we rebid that in the fall. Okay, there's a couple of uh, caveats associated with that and, uh, and I'll talk about it in just a moment. Um, you know, our feeling is that the re reduction of four versus the 23 elements is more equitable to the school buildings and allows the district to get more project scope elements completed within this project within the budget. All right, um, it also allows us for reassessment of the design and renovation of these four project elements versus the proverbial half now, half later. As we got into the design, we realized that when we developed this scope, there was a, a specific need. All right, um, I'll use the example of the high school main office, which is one of the recommended. The high school main office, we needed to um, obviously freshen the space, make it more uh, inviting, and make it more uh, user friendly. So we, we focused on the, the main office proper at the time of design because that's what the immediate need was. As we got into our design, portions of uh, the administration offices that are uh, adjacent to it would have to be disrupted to repair the main office proper, okay? So we would be going in and kind of messing up those spaces and not refurbishing the entire space. So as we went back and looked at our design, this would be a recommendation because we would want to do that space as a whole. Okay, that's what I meant by the half now, half later. And we don't want to undo work that we did in one project in the next project, okay? Uh, the same uh, holds true for the Glenmont classrooms, which is another. So um, the three large projects would, would be cleaner for uh, including in the next capital bond project because it's a package, all right? And it allows us uh, to reassess the needs of the spaces and allows for um, some concerns we have with logistics. Uh, to meet our schedule. Our schedule did shorten up. Again, we're, we, we plan on, our goal is to finish in fall, late fall of uh, 24, but it does, we have been affected. All right, um, so uh, Glenmont Classrooms and Slingerland's Cafeteria and Kitchen would be a challenge for us to, to meet that goal, but we have measures in place that if, they, if we do do this work, we'll do our best to make it happen. Okay, I, uh, real quickly, I mentioned the alternates. Um, we had six alternates built into the bid. Um, one through six, I'll read them quickly. Owner preferred door hardware. Um, I want to explain that. That is an alternate because it is public bid and we cannot have, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the contractors can bid and they can give us an equal or equal. Um, so w we went through the last five years of redoing all of our keys and locks on all of the district doors as part of an internal project. We spent tens of thousands of dollars incorporating our security locks for every classroom door and the door hardware associated with that. If we did not have owner preferred, currently we have what's its best is the, the manufacturer, we could get Slage or something else which wouldn't um, uh, be the same as what we have now. Um, so there was an owner preferred door hardware alternate. We had an owner preferred high school fire alarm alternate, a Glenmont fire alarm system replacement, middle school dust collection system replacement, hammer grill gla classroom casework replacement, and middle school auditorium flat area. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Those were alternates. 
um, because we weren't sure where our bids were gonna come in and if we incorporated them, that would have been $1.2 million that we could add to our overage if they were built into the base bid, all right? So um, we, we are recommending we accept alternate number one at $65,000 because we have to have all the same lock sets district-wide, okay? Um, so that, that means that we were not able to accept $1.2 million worth of alternates um, that were um, in addition to the base bid. Okay. So I just, I, I wanted to talk quickly about um, uh, the, the proposal to accept the, uh, the bids this evening is, is out for the Board of Education to consider. So I wanted to talk about um, what we're gonna get back, if you will. In other words, if we ask them not to do a particular element, it's called a deduct change order because we already went to bid, okay? It's, it's a um, industry standard in that, and it's a law, that you can't just say, never mind, we don't wanna do that because it's, then it wouldn't be fair to the second lowest bidder because they said, well, I, if we had bid that and knew that, we would have lowered our number or something along that line. So I wanted to make sure that folks understand what a deduct change order is and how we intend on um, closing that budget gap. So the process by which we come up with our budgets is a pre-referendum, the owner and architect, we establish our, our project elements and we put a number to them, okay? Um, and that's based on many, many um, factors. Um, there's sim simple ones like price per square foot. There's also the um, how um, technical the job is. Uh, again, if, when we raised the uh, stage at the high school, that wasn't 100 bucks per square foot. That was many bucks per square foot. So there's a lot of factors associated with that. Um, so, and then we, we go into design development. We, we get approval and we say, hey, okay, yes, we agree we're gonna spend $40.7 million on this project. These are the elements we're gonna do. The architect gets to work and they start designing it, all right? Um, and then we had a submission estimate. Um, here in Bethlehem, normally we would have a bid estimate just before we go to bid, but because of the process that we uh, endured, I'll use the term endured, um, with, with state education department, we decided to do a, a, a SED submission estimate prior to sending our project. And that's when we found that we were over by $10 million, okay? So then we solicited our bids, the contractors bid, um, we received them, we vet and qualify them. And again, vetting and qualifying is making sure that they carried um, dollars for what they were supposed to do in the project and didn't carry dollars for things they weren't supposed to. So the process when we receive unfavorable bids are, option one on the other slide was reject everything and, and not do the project. Um, that is not our recommendation. So if the bids received exceed the construction budget, reductions are required to, uh, to be able to award the contracts and we can't exceed our construction budget in the contracts. So the construction manager requests cost reduction estimates of specific scope elements from the contractor. Um, not every single one because they will not do that. They were, they're not gonna break out 200 elements and say, well, I, my bid was $12 because it's not that simple. Um, there's a, uh, if, if I'll use an example here, if we were gonna rebuild that stage, it's not just one contractor doing that. You have an electrician, you have a general contractor, you have, uh, gym floor uh, painting companies and sub subcontractors associated. So we asked them to give us numbers on some of these elements, okay? And my example here was the middle school auditorium because that is one that we're gonna um, recommend that the board rebid in the fall. So we got those estimates and again, it is an estimate. I want to uh, highlight that. The district is not gonna receive full value of a deduct change order, okay? Because there, there's many factors, um, several which is why we won't get that is, um, you know, contractor labor. So if, if we took out a large element and they planned on having 20 of their workers working for six months, there's a cost associated with that because now what are they gonna do with these folks? They assume that we were gonna 
use their folks. So now they got to find more work or they got to uh, take measures to keep them on the payroll. The other is that the contractor is most likely going to keep the profits that they had in there, the overhead and profit, that they didn't get for that work. Okay? And if you uh, research this, you'll find there's many other, and most of the time you can't get a true answer. Um, the other thing that they have to do is buy out their subcontractors. Okay? So um, we never get full value is the point. So with the auditorium, at pre-referendum, we estimated that we, the, the, the cost of the work that was designed at that time was about $2.1 million. Then at SED submission, we felt that with the economy factors and some of the design work, that it was going to cost us $2.7 million. Right? So after we received bids, the general contractor was about $4.2 million higher than expected. So for, for the overall project, um, we asked them, hey, if we didn't do the auditorium and did it later, what would you give us back? And the general contractor said 725000 The electrical said $500,000. You'll note, I'll note that in one moment. Um, the mechanical contractor said two hundred and forty-seven, and the controls contractor said thirty-four for a total of $1.5 million. Right? One may ask, well, geez, we thought it was going to cost 2.7, and we're over budget. Why did we only get 1.5 back? Well, the reason that it's such a small number is we were given a range, and that 500 even is the one I want to focus on, the 500,000 even from the electrical contractor. They, we, the district, have 30 days to award contracts per our contract or per our bid. All right, we have spoken with all of our contractors, and they have agreed to at least give us until after this evening, okay, so that we can make decisions. They've been working with us. All right, so these estimates, again, it says post-bid cost reduction estimates by contractor. It is just that, an estimate. They gave us a range. We, the team, used the low end of the spectrum on this. That's why that number looks very low. All right, so the range could be 500,000 to a million, but I used the low end to be conservative, okay? I didn't want to come to the board and to the public and say, you know, oh yeah, we're gonna use the high end of the range and we're gonna expect that back and everything's great. We, we were not comfortable in doing that. So the expectation is that the deduct change order number is gonna go up. And um, I don't wanna say it has to, but it, it, it kinda does because the electrical is an easy one to pull out, all right, because that is specific work. It's the audio and it's the lighting, okay? It's not like they're running pipe everywhere and doing it. It's, it's the equipment and everything. So those are single line items that are easily pulled out. So the expectation is, without question, that the electrical is going to go up, okay? Um, the, um, if the deduct change orders come in more favorable, than expected, which we are expecting them to go up, we may be able to uh, add some of the, an element or some of the elements back into the project. But tonight we're asking the board to approve those four uh, elements to be removed. All right, so one would ask, why didn't we have them break out all 200 elements? And again, they will not do that. That is a lot of time and effort on their part, and they don't have a contract yet. So we chose, we. Um, we spent a lot of time figuring this out. I use the term a slide puzzle. What dollar amount do we need to um, reduce and how many elements um, would that take to do that? All right, so you saw that we could do 23 or we could do four. And when we picked those four, there was several factors associated with it. It wasn't just a dollar amount. It was fitting it into the schedule, overall impact, and again, the uh, did we, and I don't want to say design it right, we designed it to what we needed back in 19, but now program and things have changed. So that all played a factor in how we determine these four elements, okay? Okay, so our reduction solution summary to meet the $3.7 million was um, we had miscellaneous reductions. Um, I, I tried to come up with a really good word for that, but the, the point to that is there was no scope removal. In other words, these are, say, I'll use the term savings or reductions that we can do that does not remove any construction from the project, 
okay? So we reviewed our incidental budget and we're able to reduce that by $411,000, all right? We, review, we value engineered additional items at, uh, as, as a, at a reduction of 479,000 and we had voluntary contractor deductions. Um, and, I, and I had a question earlier about, geez, why would the contractor voluntarily give you back money? Okay, and w the reason that they would do that is at the time of bid, uh, an example of this would be when they went out to bid, they have subcontractors. Um, and I'm gonna use the general contractor as an example because he had the highest amount of voluntary deductions. He could not get a site work sub to give him a number in, the, in his time frame because everybody was so busy. So he carried a number. He said, well, I'm gonna cover myself and I'm gonna put X to do this site work as I see it on our drawings. Okay, once he, we, we went out to bid, our numbers came in high. He was able to get those numbers in the meantime and said, hey, yeah, I, I don't know what numbers they physically carried, but I carried a million dollars, um, it came in at 700, I'm gonna give you back to $300,000. Okay, that, that's considered a voluntary deduct. The other way a voluntary deduct would happen is if they carried something that they thought they should have and shouldn't. Okay, so they will voluntarily, without a change order, de reduce their, um, their, their cost to us. Uh, an example of that is, oh geez, I thought I was responsible to do that portion of the site work when in fact the lighting installer was putting those footings in. So they realized that when the construction managers, um, and I'll use the term grilled them and vetted them and said, you know, did you carry this or didn't carry that? And, and we straightened that out. So that's what a voluntary deduct change order, or correction, voluntary uh, contractor deduction is. So if you look at the, the things that we did that don't affect scope, we were able to reduce by $1.2 million. That budget gap of 3.7 now is reduced by 1.2. So our recommendation is to remove four larger scope elements at a cost estimated, again, cost reduction of 2.6 million. Those being the middle school auditorium, as you saw before, it was about 1.5 million, Schlingerland's kitchen and cafeteria at 770, Glenmont classroom finishes at 160, and high school main office at 175. If we were to um, do these reductions as recommended, we would re reduce by $3.84 million. Okay, next slide, please. And this sums it up for you. If you add those together, our voluntary deducts, the estimated post-bid reductions, and our incidental budget reductions, it's that 3.84 minus the budget variance, it leaves $70,000 in our terms on the table. Okay, and that's for, um, and that's a good number. If we were leaving a million dollars there, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. Okay, folks, um, but none of the elements are exactly $70,000. So we kind of left that there because we believe that's gonna go up when we actually award a contract and get our deduct change orders. Next slide. So this evening, the recommendations and the request to the Board of Education from the project team is to approve the removal of the following four large project scope elements, which being the middle school auditorium, Schlingerland's Kitchen and Cafeteria, Glenmont Classroom Finishes, and the High School Main Office. That would be the first step. Next would be to approve the award of the contracts as issued to the Board of Education. Um, and then approve the rebid of the middle school auditorium in the fall of 23 as a single project using capital reserve to augment the funding. Um, again, voter approval would be required. And approve the deferral of Schlingerland's Kitchen and Cafeteria, Glenmont Classroom Finishes, and the high school um, renovation, high school main office renovation to a future capital bond project. And again, I'll put the caveat, if we are more favorable, we may be able to add one of those back in. And that is my presentation this evening. May I answer any questions? I'm turn my mic back on. I'm sure there are some questions. So, but I just wanna restate what you just said at the end. So if, and, and thank you for, the explanation about the deduct change orders because that was something I was trying to figure out in mm -hmm. terms of why the numbers didn't match up, but sure. now that makes sense. Um, so if they come back more favorably than currently anticipated, then we might, for example, add back in the Glenmont classroom finishes. Correct. That would be the idea. Right. 
Um, and, and I just wanted to, that would be another recommendation to the board. Um, I have some ideas because those four were chosen. Um, we need to do the, the middle school auditorium. That's why we're recommending going back out the bid. Okay, we want to do that, we need to do that. It, it really affects program at the middle school, so that's what, how we would fund that. The other two, Glenmont classrooms need a redesign, okay? Because when we got in deeper into the design and we started doing destructive testing, we found that the walls would not support what we designed for them. Okay, so I, wouldn't, I don't think I would recommend those, and we don't have enough time to fit it in this project, quite honestly. Okay. Um, and the same with um, uh, the Slingerland's cafeteria and kitchen. Doing those at the same time is very difficult logistically because we need to prep the food and we need to feed the children. Okay, um, unlike our last bond project when we did Glenmont, we were able to move the serving line into the cafeteria and it was only a stone's throw away from where the children were used to going and getting their food, and then they ate right in the cafeteria. Um, and the high school, same thing with the design, you know, half now, half later, we feel that it would be more uh, beneficial for the district and more cost effective if we did it all at once in a future project. So I, I will let the cat out of the bag now. My recommendation would be due to Slingerland's kitchen. I would do that if we have the funds available. That way, when we do the future bond project, we don't run into the same logistical problem, right? And we also have some needs from food service to, uh, part of that was to put a walk-in cooler or cooler and freezer at Slingerlands, and that space is desperately needed. So, you know, there's an example that the, the um, best recommendation I would make is to do the kitchen, meet the needs of the district, meet the needs of food service and, and the students, and then when we do do it in the next one, we can still prep, the children can eat in the gymnasium that could become the cafeteria or in their classrooms. So there's an example of what we could do in the future by these recommendations. Nick, could you just clarify the awarding of the contracts is that it's not a formal vote by the board tonight. It's an approval to move forward with that to develop the contracts that the board would then approve. Yes, that, that is correct. Because they have to have the contracts in place for the board to actually approve them. So that, okay. so that we can give our contractors a notice to proceed letter that yes, you are getting this job, let's get the ball rolling. And then what we would present to the board, and we, we, we plan on doing this on May 17th board meeting because we have to draw these contracts up fully and it's gonna take a bit of time to get the deduct change, or, change order paperwork in order. Then we would present to the board at the May 17th, you would award the contracts and then following that, if awarded, you would uh, approve the deduct change orders. Okay, okay? and, I, and that, that's a good question. Um, one thing I wanna make you aware of, when we do that, we would award the, the bids as they bid. So for example, $13.9 million, okay? Well, it actually is $13,665 because they had voluntary deducts and we do have alternate number one added in, so it's, 13665000 That's not what we're gonna end up paying them because they're gonna give us a whole bunch of money back in the next deduct change order. Does that make sense, folks? Mm -hmm. Because we can't do a deduct change order if we don't have an awarded contract. There's nothing to deduct it from. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a paperwork. But I, um, so that's why we wouldn't, we're not asking for anyone to sign a contract or anything this evening because we have to have all that paperwork, and it's gonna take a couple of weeks to be able to present it to the board so that it's crystal clear and the numbers match and we know exactly what we're getting back. That would also afford us the opportunity for the, the contractors to get away from the estimate and give us the real deduct change order number. That's when we hopefully will be able to present to the board that yes, they came in much higher. If approved, we recommend adding X back into the project. And can you, and this, if you'd like to defer to John, feel free. Um, how much is in the capital reserve, just for anybody um, listening who might? I would love to defer to John. I, I know that I know that 2019 <laughs> has about 1.7 million, but I, I don't know what else. Presently, you have 7.9 million right. available between both the 2019 and the 2022 capital reserve. Okay, thank you. And, and knowing that, um, and having conversation. Um, we didn't recommend doing these for, putting these 
four projects out to bid. Notice we only recommend doing the auditorium. Um, that in discussion with administration and the team, we don't want to eat up our entire capital reserve, okay? Um, th uh, th there's, there may be a difference in opinions with some folks, but um, you know, the cafeteria and the kitchen here at Slingerlands are functional, they're um, usable, et cetera. Okay, um, is it an emergency that we eat up our capital reserve to try to fit that in in the fall? Our opinion is no, okay, and, and the same with the other three. Um, really, I think the, the next highest priority would be that kitchen, okay? So that's why we didn't put, recommend putting all four out to bid in the fall. We don't wanna chew up our capital reserve. And just to be crystal clear about it, if we go out to do that, to bid, to, for the community to vote on that, and use the capital reserve, there's not, we're using money we already have. There's not a tax impact to the community. For, for the additional one, if you use capital reserve money, yes. that's correct. Okay. Right. Catherine, I think you had some questions. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm so sorry. I'm very perplexed about the alternates that, and I, you spent a lot of time explaining them and I still don't quite grasp it. Could you just Sure. Take it at the, the highest level, like what is uh, help? Okay, no <laughs> problem. You. I'm sorry. So when, when we have our drawings, we say this is what we want you to build, okay? When we were doing our estimating, we kind of had a, an idea that um, we're gonna be high. Okay, so typically what you can do is you can say, if our bids came in favorable, there would be an alternate, you have an alternate portion of the work on the drawings, it's highlighted or, or flagged, and it says alternate number one. Okay, alternate number one, provide owner preferred door hardware, okay? Owners Correct, owners, us. So, but it's explicitly written, that's not part of base bid. They give us a separate number, they give us a base bid to do all the work, and then they give us a separate number for the alternate work. Does that make sense to you? And yeah. I can give you more examples. So I think so. I think what you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying like this, to, to, to use the door hardware, for yes. example, you're saying they're providing alternate pricing depending on what choices the district goes with, whether we approve the own, our preference or whether they're suggesting or go with this other brand or, I'm uh, okay. sorry. Okay, um, so using the door hardware. Yeah, sorry. They're gonna base bid. They could bid uh, a different, uh, manufacturer, okay, and it's going to come in, and it's, I'm going to use a number, and it's not relevant. The number, it's just for ex explanation. If they were to use Slage, it's thirty thousand dollars to do this scope of work. Mm -hmm. Well, the owner is saying we don't want Slage. We can't make you provide anything because it's public bid, mm -hmm. okay. So we're asking, what would it cost us if you did provide us with best hardware versus Slage? So we said that is an alternate. To this the base bid okay so we're asking them how much is it going to cost us to get what we want essentially instead of what they're offering for that correct because they can substitute as long as it is an or equal okay and can I continue? so um the proposal that that you all are recommending includes um it, it, on this pie chart slide is that it includes alternates that were not, not accepted included. So they would be considered a reduction as well. That's why I, oh. there's five alternates that we're, we can't accept because they, they cost $1.2 million more. I see. Okay, so we are recommending we accept alternate one so that we do get our door hardware so that it matches district wide. Oh, I see, and you're just saying, but not the other alternates. Not the other provided. five. There were Thank six you. in total. And when I say can't, you could, right, but right. then we'd have to reduce something else and that kind of wouldn't look right because base bid is the work that we wanted. We chose these as alternates because when they were estimated, we realized, geez, um, the middle school dust collection system was $600,000 once it was estimated out and fully. Because what we learned was that <laughs> um, the New York State code changed. Okay, and that's, that's what tripped, I don't wanna say tripped us up, but that's what, what changed. I was like, well, why can't we just, all we gotta do is take this one out and put this one in. That changed in 2021 New York State Fire Code and Building Code. Got so, it. Uh, uh, Drew will, <laughs> remember, I know. <laughs> no,
No, but I mean, he remembers me jumping up and down like this is not good right, right. because we really wanted to do that dust collection system, but when priced out, it was $600,000. So we made that an alternate because we knew that we had to, um, instead of reducing the 69 elements, yeah. okay, we came up with six more that we really wanted to do. If bids came in favorable, all we would ask that the board to do would be to accept that alternate. Okay, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the bids did not, not come in on our favor. So those items are considered part of the reduction elements and go on to the next um, capital project scope elements. Thank you for walking me through it. I'll take you up over Does coffee on that <laughs> offer, but maybe for the pig student's sake, we won't do it tonight now. But the dust, the dust collection codes. Oh, I'll back up. Yeah. I'm <laughs> And then in the future, if we wanted to do that, the board could pass a resolution to have a single source, I, I call it. Uh, for example, um, in places I worked before, the board could pass a resolution saying that uh, technical building services is our building automation system supplier. That way, if we bid a job, um, we don't get Honeywell and uh, uh, technical building, um, uh, train tracer, uh, carrier CCI, you know, now we don't want five different building automation systems that can't talk to each other because they don't have open protocol. So um, we don't, fortunately, we haven't run into that situation here at Bethlehem, but you could do that with locks. You could do it with fire alarm. You could do it with our building automation down the road if we feel that uh, the, dish, uh, the board is not comfortable with um, owner preferred alternates. Okay. All right. Meredith, did you have a question? Um, just quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make sure if we take out specifically Slingerlands, the work on Slingerlands Kitchen and Glenmont Classroom Finishes, are those schools still getting work done or are we not doing any work on those? Schools? No, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, I'll use Slingerlands because we're here. So Slingerlands is getting a substantial amount of work. I talked logistics. Um, we are doing um, the basement classrooms, all of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the bulk of that down there is music and art and there's OTPT downstairs, okay? They need more space and they need fresh 2020 space, okay? Um, ceilings are low, lighting is awful, acoustics are terrible, and they don't have what they need, okay? So they're getting that, but we have a domino effect here at Slingerlands. To do what we have to do downstairs, we have to do work upstairs, okay? So on the stage in the cafeteria, there's that large wall with a beautiful um, uh, tile on it, Behind that is all of our one-on-one -on -one spaces for, for uh, the students, and we have to renovate that area. So now we're, we're working in the cafeteria, the kitchen, on the stage, and the old, I call it the old faculty room, the existing faculty space across. We're kind of doing a slide puzzle so that we can accommodate the rebuilding of the um, spaces downstairs. So Slingerlands is also getting, um, oh my goodness, uh, a pavilion outside. The, 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 the bulk of it, though, is the program work here. We're not cutting any of the program. I, I guess you could consider food service part of the program, but um, we can still prep and, and feed our kids here. Um, and, and 
I apologize, I'm having a, a yeah, blank. I don't but need the there, specifics. I just want to make sure we, that it we, was an equitable decision. Uh, you just took okay. the words out of my mouth. I spent a lot of time making sure that we were equitable across mm -hmm. the district. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, I wrote an email to the superintendent because there were some questions and I had it all laid out that, um, that's why I have it actually in my brain, that um, looking at the equity across the district, um, Slingerland's last bond in 2016 had you know some minor internal but major external renovations done to the building. All right, um, Glenmont, same thing. Their entire exterior with some interior. They had their whole kitchen done um, and things like that. So we are still going to do all the work as laid out to, um, to the public and to the um, Board of Education with the exception of those four classrooms. Okay, so that would be the only scope cut. We're still doing the floors, we're still doing the pit area, still doing the boilers, still doing the air handling equipment, um, and everything but that one element. All right, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, Eagle and Ellesmere really didn't have anything that we could reduce. Okay, there's two things really happening at El uh, Eagle. One is our storm outfall, and that's substantial. I think we talked about that once where, um, we have uh, storm water that goes down the ravine and the ravine is literally sloughing off or falling down. We're having a landslide. So that has to be repaired. We can't not do that or we're gonna lose our field. Okay, and the same with their windows. There's some window issues, All right? Ellesmere had a ton of work done last bond. Okay, the only real thing they're getting in this bond go round is a pavilion and some playground elements. Really can't cut those. That's program, that's students, that affects the kids. Right? And then as we go down the list, Glenmont would lose one element and that's those four classrooms because they really need to be looked at. We have some structural issues. It's not as simple as going in and taking the stuff off the walls and putting it back. We found that um, late in the game um, when we were doing uh, destructive testing for HAS. Um, and then here at Slingerlands, the bulk is uh, program oriented so we wouldn't be losing that. They're also getting a um, playground uh, a pavilion and oh, um, our piping, our piping that we stopped. Um, our classrooms, our, our elementary wing, all have sinks and bathrooms, and we have had a, a rash of problems with the piping that's down in the crawl spaces. So we prepped it last bond project, and we need to make the repairs this bond project. And just to clarify, there's not a safety issue with the Glenmont classrooms no. that you're saying, no. okay. Um, you know, in speaking with the principal, it's it's more of a, it's a it's aesthetic, okay. But they are due for a refresh. We still have the old metal blinds. The ceilings are unfinished. When I mean by unfinished, they're exposed ceilings. They're painted. They're in good repair. Uh, but the walls themselves um, have this. It looks like vinyl as a coating, which is very odd. It's not wallpaper. It's a vinyl material. We, we presume. So there's no safety aspect associated with any of these. Um, the only concern with uh, any of those four elements is the kitchen here at Slingerlands with food service. The, the expectation was we were gonna have that additional freezer space. And if the board recalls during the pandemic, we rented a 40 foot freezer because of the supply chain issues, Not we had to buy ahead and we had no place to store it. Um, that freezer since been sent back situation like that but that would allow our food service director to store more food that we could send out um, and this is the largest elementary school so we really wanted to get that kitchen done. Okay thank you. Okay. Willow did you have a question? Uh, I did I had two quick ones that relate to one another I'm just trying to understand whether the um, the option you're recommending and the other option are just a product of math or whether they're whether they reflect the prioritization system that went in. Like the, the other option that I understand is not the one you're recommending with the 23 items. Are those 23 low priority items or is it just 23 items that happen to add up to the amount that you were looking to reduce? No, those were the 23 that we could cut to make that dollar amount, okay? And some of them are substantial uh, and would cut deeply, okay? Um, off the top of my head, Glenmont's boiler system. Things to have school 
Yeah. Okay. So it was math. Right. Well, it's math and and uh, it's it's uh, how do I say it? We couldn't ask them to give us a line item breakout. We, we can only give them a select few. So looking at all those to make that same dollar amount, excuse me, based on the uh, the gap, we would have to cut 23 to equal those four. So it is math. And, and those four, though, the chosen four, I, I kind of already talked about it, I don't want to be redundant, but, you know, the logistical aspect, the dollar amount, and um, we weighed some of those 23, you know, the boilers were uh, 600,000, let's say, okay, well, we don't want to cut that because it's too much, so, you know, it kind of yep. was that slide puzzle to fit the budget gap. Okay, and then, um Jody, I guess I'm just looking for you to tell me that this recommendation for these four items aligns with sort of the district review of the priorities and this yes. makes sense. Yeah, so um, the, the principals and other people who have been involved in this, I think all support this. I mean, obviously everyone would have loved to see all of these things, including the elements we already reduced in the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think they make sense. Some of this, uh, to Nick's point, is a timing issue that you, some of these just couldn't be done within the time frame that we are trying to get the project done. I think the middle school auditorium, there are still some design elements that came up during the development that the floor issue was one of them that was not um, initially discussed. So it gives us more time to build that into the project and still ultimately get that project done. Yeah, I mean, yeah. to me, the middle school auditorium is super high up there. Right. Um, have we had a capital reserve project rejected by the voters in anyone's recent memory? No. And we've never um, done it. So the capital reserve has always been used to offset a larger bond. So we haven't actually had a vote just to use capital reserve to fund a project. But in speaking with some of the um, other superintendents in the area, they have done that in recently with bond projects because of the same issues that we're experiencing, that they haven't had enough money to finish some of the projects, so they've gone out to get a vote using capital reserve funds to finish certain projects that they deemed a priority. I'm sorry, I know I said I only had two questions. That would go on, <laughs> that would go on the May ballot or that would be a fall that would have standalone? To be, yeah, that would have to be probably a fall. All right, I'm done. So one of the alternates was that flat spot in the auditorium that came up late in the design. Um, the value that the uh, general contractor bid was $204,000 to do that little flat spot. All right, and that's why this came up. Does it make sense to spend $204,000 to put a flat spot that truly, in speaking with the stakeholders, is not 100% what they desire? That was a makeshift, quick, well, we could do this. Well, let's see how much it costs. That's two hundred thousand dollars. That in the future, um, what we want to do is remove the floor in its entirety, design it to the way that uh, that meets the needs of the stakeholders. Whether we do the entire floor into a flat spot, all of the auditorium chairs get replaced. So, does it make sense now to pull all those chairs out, make a flat spot for two hundred thousand, plus the flat spots for our ADA uh, location? put all these brand new chairs on and then say, hey, you know, well, we'll push that to another project. To me, that didn't make sense. So we, we kind of said, well, let's do it um, not right because what we're designing is right, but let's meet the needs of the stakeholders. Because um, we have, you know, a program in there and we also have uh, theater, 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 yeah, theater and music. So, um, you know, the stakeholders came together and determined that that's what the needs were. So we tried to If we go out in the fall to use the capital reserve to do the middle school auditorium, do we need to get any kind of new SED approval, any new bids, any, I'm just thinking of anything else that's gonna <laughs> shut this down, like Drew, slow this Drew down. answered that quickly. Oh. Um, the, the nice thing is, is that SED approved the entire project, the entire project, including the 69 elements that we removed in the fall. Because as you remember, we realized our budget situation, as we were submitting the SED, we did not have time to remove them um, at that time. So
So every last bit of this project, whatever it costs, is approved at SED. So as long as our scope doesn't stray from that, um, and say, oh, well, we're doing the auditorium for middle school, why don't we just go over and do the gym? I know we just did the yeah. last project. <laughs> but if our scope creeps in that direction onto something that is totally unidentified with what's more, we run into trouble and we might need to reach the fence. But the fact that anything we'd be looking to do again or to bring back into the project either a rebid in the fall or in uh, opportunistically when our got changed or just come back well, all that's already in the state. It's already all fully approved at the state by then. Um, so there's no more uh, SD uh, issue there with approval. Okay. And hypothetically, I'm not going to hold you to it, but would you have an idea of what the timing would look like? Would we, you know, start work in say February or end of January and I'm not, I'm not sure how long for, it would for take the auditorium. for the auditorium. If we did a vote in the fall, uh, let's say October, it was approved, the project's already approved, we could potentially start sometime during the year, correct? Yes. Because that's kind of, you can keep that separate from the middle okay. school so it's not disruptive, which could be a positive because the auditorium then wouldn't be out of use for an entire year. It could be half a year next year and half a year the following year, which would still allow some use during both mm -hmm. of those times. Okay. Yeah, and, the, and the other thing is, uh, we, we did this, if, if you recall, when we did the middle school pool. Kind of the same thing happened. Um, the middle school pool was designed, ready to go, and when we, by the time we, we started doing construction, we noticed that we had some serious structural issues. Okay, so then we said, wait, let's not pull the trigger on this, let's wait, redesign it, then we kept it in the project, but we put it out as a separate package. Okay, and so that meant that um, we bid it separately once we knew exactly what we needed to do. And it, we had an electrician, we had the GC, the plumber, et cetera, and the mechanical, all one little mini package under the umbrella of the 2016 capital project. So this would be very similar. And I have heard zero complaints about our beautiful pool facility over so it actually worked out much, much better for us. Catherine, did you have another question? Yeah, um, sorry, one jumped to mind uh, that had come in um, that I forgot to raise earlier, which was just, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm assuming it's implicit that we are allowed to accept bids when we only have a single bidder. Um, I, I got in a question because folks were under the impression that as a municipality or something, we had to have more than one bidder, then no. Okay, great. If it's a public bid process and you only get one bidder, that's it's okay. still a public bid process. Perfect. I just. Totally wrong. We would love to get through. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I just, I just <laughs> wanted, I, that was my, I, I assume that was implicit. I just wanted to, yeah. to make it explicit. Um, so thank you. And then, um, Jody, you were talking about going out to vote. Would we just do that in, as part of the November election? Like when, like, would we? Uh, we haven't done it. Uh, aligned with the general election. Okay. Um, we've typically done it just totally separate. Okay. Part of the issue would be getting voting machines. Yeah, right. So right. we would probably not do that. I would think maybe October. Okay. Um, or trying to not align with that so where it's a disruption or we have trouble getting the voting machines. No, I just was wondering if there was a way to piggyback so that we didn't uh -huh. have the cost of running our own. Yeah, that would be great. Referendum or, you know, yeah. additional. Okay. That doesn't usually work. That's not how it goes. No. Okay, thank you. Christine, I think. Yeah, I have, a, I have a couple questions. So out of our large projects, and I don't remember the, this, how many do we have that are over like a million? Is it, I know there's the auditorium, the cafeteria, the turf field. What do we have, like what large, because we're cutting those four projects, but they're not all over a million. There's only two over a million. How many, is it like 50%? Like I just wasn't sure how many large projects we had. Um, that are I running. don't, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't pull it up, I apologize. Right. <laughs> I couldn't find it. If, if I may, because I don't have that, the, the values in my okay. head, but I do have the same document that you have, and if I can scan it real quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so you're looking for items. I was just wondering how many large projects we had that were like over a million. Okay, I'm looking. Right, uh, yeah. No, I'm you, don't, you don't have to count. I mean, I was just, no, I'm, if I'm you knew it, there. it was fine. <laughs> that are over a million dollar amount wise? Yeah, total? yeah. Oh. Well, the reason I'm asking is because when, you know, money goes through my head and I'm thinking about where you said the reductions, they aren't dollar for dollar. 
and it seems like maybe a little bit of that might go into like the contingency that we're cutting because we're not getting dollar for dollar that might still be kind of contingency money if, it, if we can't offset it you know take the offset of let's say we put out to SED 2.7 for the auditorium but we're only getting a 1.5 credit that leaves 1.2 so when we add those projects that we're not getting dollar for dollar, we're looking at like probably like two and a half million in there. So one, I'm trying to figure out where that's going. And the other question I had is, do we think that when we go out to bid again on like the auditorium or the cafeteria, that costs are gonna go up from where we got the bids now? Because I thought that's what you said. We don't. Well, which that's a risk we are going to have to take. However, But do we think those dollars, so we had 2.7 as part of this package for SED. Do we think with the changes and maybe the costs of either labor or materials going up, we're looking at over a three point something project for the auditorium. Um, Is that one of the reasons we're deferring it? Because we think those projects are gonna be well above where we're currently at. I wouldn't use the word well above. I think a fair statement would say would be above most likely, uh, we're hoping that this is peaking and we're going to go back down in the other direction. But it seems like when uh, roofing material was our, our hard nut to crack and now it's not roofing, it's HVAC. And then steel did that. It, so it's, it's unknown right now in today's economy. Um, but what we do know is we should get more competitive bids. So with the concern of losing the dollars and the offset on the credit or the deductions, my other question is, and I'm not going to be a popular person for saying this out loud, if you took the TUR field, which is approximately, what, $5 million, uh -huh. and postpone that because those costs are relatively stable, and they came in at bid, and we know they're going to stay probably relatively the same, would it make sense to defer that just till the fall and then just defer it to the following summer. And then you can do those projects that have been waiting for a while to be done. And I'm certainly not saying do not do a turf field, so I want to be very clear no, here. No, no but you know. It just, the dollar for dollar right. seems we'll get right. more money. But the amount of program by excluding that, that would affect our student athletes and student body PE, I wouldn't make that right. Even with like the Slingerlands kitchen serving these students in the auditorium at the middle school, they a I actually think it would serve more students. Than, than the turf field? Yeah, if you took the number of students here and the number of students at the middle school for the auditorium, that would well, be more than the students that use the turf field at the high school for a year. It's only a year. We're only talking a year. Um, it just seems to seem to me that we would lose less dollars because we already have a bid for that we have them locked into the costs and the turf is more stable in costs that it would make sense to defer one project versus all of these projects that's just i'm just throwing it out there that's all um, and, and again, for discussion with the board and, you know, it, it, it hit me I'm you can see my wheels are spinning i'm thinking so you, you had a lot right there um i don't want to say it's it's not that simple there are pros and cons to that. Yes, we have our bid now, and then um, we, they won't hold that bid till fall. So everything could go up or down or whatever. So there's the same risk. Um, the, the beauty of using the co-op is we get the best price, we get it now, we should take advantage of that. All right, that's an opinion, again. Um, and that's why I would recommend proceeding with that. But the amount of program that that affects, I think, again, I don't, I don't want to look 
Okay, I can I just, I'm sorry. It, We've just spent like so many board meetings talking about turf. I just don't think we need to relitigate the reasons for the turf. I think we, um, and that's not no, any I disrespect to you. I just think we 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 agree with you, right? Yep, we made yep. the decision Agreed. to support the turf. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure. <laughs> Thank you. you know, I, I understood. Okay. So back to your first question, Ms. Beck. Um, so the roofs at the middle school are 1.8 million. Um, the uh, uh, hammer grow roof is over a million. The LMC I was just throwing out the, the costs and okay. the stability of turf. Understood. Yeah. And just, and just, to be, just to be clear, um, we don't love that we're getting back pennies on the dollar when we do these DOT changeovers. But unfortunately, that's just that's just the way it is. You're not going to get back that. You're just not going to get back all your value. Now, and we talk about it a lot, and it hurts, right? I, we don't. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I don't think there are any other questions at this point. So I think Nick needs to know just the direction the board is comfortable moving toward because he has yeah. to follow up with the bidders. I, I mean, I, I think so, unless anybody I, has a disagrees. I think, I mean, I'm disappointed by the delay. I mean, I, I don't, I think you are also. Um, you know, I think the, you know, the auditorium project in particular is really important. Um, and I do appreciate that we, you know, we want to make sure we're doing it the right way. Um, and I hope in terms of the, you know, if the timing and all of that, that we are also working with our, the stakeholders at the middle school and our music faculty to, you know, make sure that we are doing it right and, um, and accomplishing what we want to do. Any other thoughts? So, okay. So yes. Thank you. <laughs> Our second presentation tonight is on English as a new language. Um, so I invite our presenters to come up. start off by um, introducing myself. I'm Andy Baker. I'm the principal here at Slenderlands Elementary. I want to thank the Board of Education uh, for coming to have your meeting this evening here at Slenderlands, so welcome. Uh, and also with me, I'll let my colleague introduce himself right here. Thank you. I'm Luis Aviles. I'm the supervisor of World Languages and English as a New Language for your district. Great. I uh, also want to thank and acknowledge some of the staff members 
members from our building that are here tonight. We've got some of our ENL teachers, uh, Mrs. Lewis, Ms. Beers, Ms. McCabe, as well as several, several other members of our staff and classroom teachers. So thank you so much for joining us. So we're gonna sort of tag team with this presentation uh, and talk about our English as a New Language program, uh, which is housed here in, in, there are three buildings in the district that house this program, uh, Glenmont, Eagle, and here at Slingerlands Elementary. We also um, are very proud of the work that we do every day, leading students on their path towards uh, their, the improvement in their English proficiency, as we have students that come from numerous countries, numerous places, and with various diverse backgrounds, uh, and we meet them where they are, and we bring them along that continuum uh, to, uh, to enhance their English proficiency, and it's, it's quite, uh, uh, you know, very rewarding work. So with that, uh, next slide, please. Um, our, is this my slide? I believe it is. <laughs> this is a loosely rehearsed uh, presentation. <laughs> um, the, so our department, of course, under the guidance of the New York, New York State Commissioner's Regulation Part 154, governs the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, provide provision of these ENL services to students in our districts um, across New York State. And I'll let uh, Senor Aviles talk a little more about that. Very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner's Regulation Part 154 is what governs our services, and it's pretty clear. It protects the rights and the needs of our students when they come as English learners to our district or to any other district in New York State. It protects the rights of the families also, and it informs them about what actions they can take when they are looking out for their children or for the services that we offer. The four links that are there are generally the links that I share with the families when they come to our district. I walk them through the orientation video, the Bill of Rights, and the parent guide. And I browse the next generation standards, so that's not, not my area too much, but I still uh, talk to them about it. These documents are available right now, I think, in about 23 languages from New York State. So we're very happy that they take on that. But whenever we need to talk to families that have limited um, time with, in, with the English language, we hire interpreters, of course, to, to be able to reach them. Uh, you can go to the next slide, which is data. We love it. Uh, this is a breakdown of our student population in our school. Uh, we have 22 students at Eagle. We don't have any students currently at Ellesmere. We would love to. We have 18 students at Glenmont. We have one student at Hammondville. We will, we will talk a little bit more about that when we look at the other slides. And we have 28 students in Slingerlands. And that brings up the total number of elementary school students to 69 currently. And then there are 14 and 15 in the secondary level and in the middle school and high school, respectively. And that puts us at 29 there, which is a total of 98. This is a high number for Bethlehem. We, when I started here a few years ago, the number was significantly lower. Uh, the number has changed because of the pandemic. We received students from other districts. We were the district that was open. We were the district that was still functioning for these families. So yeah, a lot of them moved and we were very happy to receive them. Uh, you can see the percentage that each one of those numbers um, is in terms of the ENL population. Uh, so 15% of our students are in the high school, 14% in the middle school, 22 at Eagle, 18 at Glenmont, and 28 at Slingerlands. And this is, these numbers actually reflect, the elementary school numbers at, um, especially, reflect the sizes of our schools. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Hurst because he helps us um, since we cannot put our students in their home school all the time, if they're from Elsinore or Hammondville especially, uh, we have been able to be very strategic. And if you notice, 22, 22, 28, 22, and 18 for those three schools correspond to the sizes of the schools. So we try to keep it that way. Um, next slide, please. So here is a more specific breakdown of those numbers. Notice that even though district-wide, we are right now, our students make up about 
uh, percent of the population, the total population. It's very different when we look at the elementary and secondary level. The elementary, if you notice, Eagle, Glenmont, and Slingerlands are basically at five, Slingerlands are pretty much at six percent. Uh, so that makes a big difference. It's not 2.5 percent of the population in these schools, it's actually way higher. So their presence has an impact in the classrooms. Their presence enriches the, the experiences that the other students have because they, I mean, you saw them. They are magnetic, right? They just have something special to say all the time. Um, I, was, I was about to run here and hug each one of them, but <laughs> that wouldn't have looked good on YouTube. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, that's basically the breakdown of our, of our population. And again, I, I, since our teachers are here, they do a magnificent job finding how to meet the needs of these students, which are, which are quite challenging. And as we will see on the, what each level represents, they do quite a great job trying to fit the, the services in their schedule. It's a challenge especially now with 98, 99 students, because we just got one yesterday. But, <laughs> uh, with this number of students and the staffing having been, I know that we, and I want to thank you, of course, during the pandemic we were able to increase the FTE, but even with that, the teachers can attest to how challenging it is every day. We get students, it's a transient population, we get them tomorrow, and our classrooms are already set. So all of a sudden, just one more student in the classroom uh, creates a big impact. I mean, it's a bigger impact. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, next slide, I think, is uh, the levels. I mean, yeah, I got you next to this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are, in New York State, there are five levels. And this is actually one of the modifications that the commissioner's regulations were able to bring when they were approved. Uh, the breakdown of the five levels is according to the units of study that the students are expected to receive uh, from an ENL specialist, from, uh, from someone who understands how to work with their, with their needs. Uh, students that are at the entering or emerging level, and by the way, these levels come, the, when we receive a student that is a candidate to be an ENL student, we, the teachers, uh, screen the student, they do a quick interview with the family present um, so that the family can be part of it. Right? They interview the student, the student, if the teacher determines that the student has uh, a need to develop proficiency in the English language in order to be successful in their classrooms, then they recommend that we do further screening, which is a state standardized test, it's the NICETEL. That test, if the outcome of that test is one of these five levels. If the students score commanding in that test, by the way, then they are not considered ENL students because they are proficient in the language. Otherwise, they become part of our roster. And then these five levels are the same ones that are mesh that, that come out of the NICE slide, which is the test that all ENL students take every year. The first two levels, entering and emerging, require two units of study every week uh, of support for the students, which equals to 360 minutes. We divide them uh, in a way that I don't like, it's 72 minutes a day. 72 minutes a day is not two periods, it's somewhat two periods. So it's, again, quite challenging to work around it because the students have specials, the students have services, and the students have things that make it quite difficult. Uh, transitioning and expanding students, which are the next two levels, uh, are expected to receive support for one unit of study, which is 180 minutes a week, and that one is 36 minutes. So, yeah, we usually try to meet it the best way we can. And the commanding students, once a student, so if the commanding score comes from the NICETEL, the student is not in our box. If the commanding score comes from the NICES lab, which is the test that they take every year, then the student is determined to be proficient and remains in our roster with reduced support for two years. 
we sometimes look at them and say, yeah, you're commanding, but I'm going to look at you at that third year. We don't give them services, but we still talk to the teachers to have them in the classrooms to make sure that they're doing well. Um, and these commanding students, there are two years, like I said, that they remain with us. After those two years, they go into the classrooms with uh, the expectation that they will be successful. Um, good? I think I covered it. I think I have this one too. <laughs> this is simply a breakdown of our population by level. And this is important, not only, not only district-wide, but especially uh, when it comes to the schools. 10 entering students and 10 emerging students, 19 transitioning, 25 expanding, and 34 commanding. And notice that the 34 is the highest number there. Uh, but if you think about it in terms of how many units of study the students receive, then truly the transition and an expanding number is the highest number because that group receives 180 minutes, just, uh, you know, both groups receive the same level of service. The 34 students don't take the nicest lab. So technically we have 64 students that will take the nicest lab this year and we will be accountable for their scores. The other 34, of course, they take the ELA test and other uh, assessments, but not the, life, the nicest lab anymore. Now, um, I do want to point out to one aspect. Um, I know Eagle and Glenmont have 50% of their students at a commanding level. Those students have been with us for a few years. There are basically, I don't remember how many are recent arrivals at Eagle, which might have, definitely has more than Glenmont, but it's not more than four that have arrived recently. So they have a higher number of commanding students. Slingerlands, on the other hand, has a lot of the recent arrivals. And the commanding percentage there, if I'm not mistaken, is 14%, because the students haven't been with us for a long time. So that makes a big difference when you schedule. If you have 50% of your students needing uh, 0.5 units of study, it's 18 minutes a day. That's not much. If you have 86% of your students not at the commanding level, and you're talking about a lot of students needing 72 minutes today and 36 minutes today. That is the biggest challenge for the schedule. So Ms. Autumn and Ms. Lewis, thank you very much for working around it. <laughs> you're very kind. Um, I think you're ready. Um, so, and of course it makes sense if you think about that data on the last slide, uh, it's district-wide, so you're going to see a larger percentage of students who are commanding because it's going to reflect the students who are older who have been along their path of proficiency longer or maybe, you know, moved to us, came to us um, at a level where they were more proficient in, in English um, than younger students coming in. So uh, the, the data makes sense when you think about it that way. Um, in terms of, you know, so the, the challenge is how do we deliver these minutes, these required minutes of instruction to these students, um, many of which also are multiply service students who also receive other uh, interventions. Um, and, and therein lies the challenge. And so there's, there's different ways that we deliver that instruction. Mainly it's two different ways. It's going to be a standalone model where students are gonna work in a small group setting with other ENL students. Uh, you know, what you might call like a pullout setting where they're working with, those, with that ENL instructor um, with their class by grade level. ENL instructors can work with contiguous grade levels next to each other, um, but they would go by a level. It would go by their proficiency level from the nicest lot and not uh, just because, you know, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have students working together who were, you know, three um, proficiency levels apart. They would have to be the same level and maybe contiguous grades. Co-teaching is very popular in our school. It's literally, as I can speak to that, uh, we have our instructors push in and teach directly in the classroom with the, co with the teacher, classroom teacher. And, and that model really allows for an integration of um, the services that are provided, working directly with the students in delivering the instruction and core curriculum that the teacher is providing to provide that support and to you know, allow the students to be you know, a fab part of the fabric of the class and students can learn from each other, not just 
English, but also uh, much about their cultures. So there's a real um, benefit to having that integrated uh, co-teaching model in the classroom as well. Next slide, please. So this slide shows, um, basically it shows the New York State versus Bethlehem percentage of L's across the state and across Bethlehem. And you can sort of compare visually very quickly by seeing what our top languages are at Bethlehem and what the state's top languages are. And of course, uh, maybe not a big surprise that Spanish is the largest percentage of L's across the state. Um, however, here at Bethlehem, <clears throat> um, Turkish is our largest number. We have a very large Turkish population. There is a uh, support network in the community where um, families can gather and, and can get, have resources and supports among each other in the community. So it's an attractive area for uh, members of that community. Um, so our linguistic diversity is representative of our, of our students' cultural heritage. Um, and we have, as you can see going down, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and as you go down the list, uh, you can see how those languages play out in Bethlehem as compared to the rest of the state. Uh, next slide. So with this, um, I think this is yours. <laughs> So it, it's challenging to communicate with families and make sure that they receive all the information that they need to be successful without at 3 a.m. waking up and thinking, oh my gosh, that thing is tomorrow and I don't know if people know. Uh, we try to sporadically, especially during periods of break, we schedule, we, we use this company called Lexiki. Uh, to hire interpreters and communicate with the families. And they have a service where they call mm -hmm. the homes of the families that speak uh, other languages and they use an interpreter. And we find out great information because when people are talking to someone who is from their culture and understands their language at a different, in a different way, they become more candid and they can, they can be more expressive in ways that sometimes they don't talk to us random things. We have found that people need to go to a dentist and don't even know how to. So uh, little things like that make our families more successful. And then also help us communicate information that has been sent to the home, but probably they didn't uh, pay attention the same way because it wasn't in their language or for whichever reason. We also hold in-person meetings uh, frequently as much as we can, especially the teachers do. Uh, we have an ENL newsletter that is sent to the families and can be translated into whichever language they, they need, pretty much. I think there's like 140 languages there. And our website is, uh, can be also easily translated for the languages that we have that are most common. So I think that our families are able to receive the information uh, as, as effective as we can. Now with the new programs that we are considering engaging with, yes, this will be much more effective. Parent Square does a much better job uh, with that. So we're looking forward to making it easier, not just for the ENL. We as the ENL specialists, we, we, we know how to communicate with them, but we want the whole district, we want the entire village to be able to just click on something and know that the other end will receive it in the language that they understand. So more automated. Uh, I think we can move. And now we talk about our schools. And if I'm not mistaken, is Hugo, Grandma, Hannah Gross doing that? So it's better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are some slides uh, with some pictures of our students and our families, because in some there may be some families. Um, in action in their schools. Uh, the first one is from Sli uh, Eagle Elementary. They have the second largest group in our district. Ms. Cherry and Ms. Beers work with the 22 ENL students there, 23 now. Uh, they make up 5% of the population and 32% of the students are at commanding level. Not 50 like I said. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Glenmont Elementary is home to the largest uh, I'm sure, uh, exceptional group, twice exceptional group, not sure what that means. All right, I'm gonna go and head and go to the first bullet. Uh, we are the instructor that works at that building is Ms. LeJudis, works with 18 ENL students. 5% um, of the student population 
uh, are, you know, are e comprised of, e of ELLs there, and 50% of the students at the commanding level. So it was less than 50% mm -hmm. and swing less. Uh, twice exceptional, just for the clarification, is students that probably have an IEP and are also English language learners. So they receive multiple services. Um, Hammergrill, so Hammergrill is a school that, I mean, during the pandemic we were, we had like eight students there, that felt awesome. Um, but we usually have one or two students only. Uh, there are special programs at Hammergrill, again, for our twice exceptional friends. Ms. McCabe currently goes there and helps us with our very important friend. It's only 1% of the student population. It's only one student, and we didn't want to separate him from, the, from his sibling. And they have an exceptional program for twice exceptional learners. I think next year we are going to have more students there. Okay, and of course here at Slenderlands, that's home to our largest ENL group in the district. Um, our instructors, Ms. Lewis and Ms. Beers, work with 28 um, Ls, 6% uh, of our student population in the building, and 14% of the students at the commanding level. And of course, uh, as Mr. Aviles alluded to, the students who presented tonight to you uh, here tonight were members of our um, ENL population in our, in our school. So we were, you know, we're very, very proud because we feel like we're very lucky to have the population where we can um, learn from them and they can learn from others and we can just celebrate the diversity that we have in our school when it comes to our to our L's and as you can see uh, they are quite uh, quite something so they are just like that in the classroom every day as well oh no the middle school picture <laughs> 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 So, so here's the story. The students are not going to like it. Miss McCabe, I am so sorry. I do not know what happened. The collage is on Canva. <laughs> uh, the students actually were very kind with helping us with the pictures. I apologize very much. As soon as I finish and I go back there, you know, look, look at my wife making fun of me. As soon as I'm back there, <laughs> as soon as I go back there, that picture will go in. I am so sorry. There are, there are 14 ENL students there. Uh, they make 1.5 of the student population and 50% are at the commanding level. This is very different than when I started. 25 students carried Ms. McCabe. I was looking today, there were 25 students in the middle school when I, when I got here. Our students do that well. They leave us quickly. But uh, we hope that number goes up again because it's quite low. All right, so just to finish up uh, rounding out our schools, um, BCHS home to the uh, ninth, ninth through 12th grade ENL students in the district. Ms. Devonzo working with 15, uh, represent 1% of the population and 47% of the students at the commanding level at the high school. And I believe that is it. So yeah. with that, uh, if, I was going to say, if we can, if we can take a short break um, before we have some, I bet there are probably a few questions for you guys, but that way you can find the picture, but we could um, let our pig students come up and sign out and head out. Okay. I think there's a sheet over there, and I think one over there. There's one over there if you guys want to use that one.
she's going to be a four. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, so I guess, so we just need to you know, work through that number four. And then, but that's just like a preview. Right, right. Right, right. <laughs> that's a lot of I appreciated the explanation. Yeah. 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 Because I was saying that I was like, I just don't understand. I call yeah. it on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. So I just that. I'm a customer by trade. You want to, you know. My, my resting face is upside down. Anything tax you can I don't have anything. Oh, so like Holly asked me. So. 
All right, if we can. <laughs> we'll come, uh, so come back. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your, your presentation. I had um, just a couple quick questions um, myself, and then uh, um, others had some questions. I was wondering, do we, do we offer any support over the summer to our ELL students? Uh, so we don't. We don't have a summer program currently. We, okay. we were thinking about it, but it's, it's not going to happen this summer. Okay. We have thought about it. Okay. All right. And we may have, there may be students who are in, uh, for example, um, like the ESY or the ELF program who also are co-serviced or twice exceptional. I was not familiar with that term. And then, so they may be ELs who are just, uh, receiving a special ed summer program. Sure. Yeah, I was. That would be a smaller, a much smaller number. Yeah, I was thinking more about students that maybe don't qualify for that program, but maybe it would, it would help to have some additional um, English over the summer. Something to keep thinking about, I guess. Um, and then the other thing, and, and um, I, I may, may have been in the parent guide that you um, had a link to, um, but I was just wondering whether we provide information to the parents or guardians of our students about where they can go to have some English, um, English lessons for themselves, like yes, whether I do that through the newsletter. Okay. On the newsletter, I point to different opportunities. There mm -hmm. are many with BOCES, ELT, so there are mm -hmm. places now. Okay, so we share that with them. Yeah, um, I even include information about the new American office mm -hmm. from New York State and some programs that help refugees and immigrants. And Great, thank you. Catherine, do you have a question? Meredith? Um, I was just wondering how we decide which school to send um, the children to. Well, if, there, if it's not their home school, right. uh, if it's Elsmere or Hammondrell, it, it's a combination. Dr. Mm -hmm. Hurst has a good role there. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I know that we look at how close the family is. Many of our families have cousins, you know, relatives, mm -hmm. friends. If that's the case, we try to put them in a place that they are already there because mm -hmm. that friend, relative, or whomever they know already knows the school culture mm -hmm. can help them navigate how the teachers operate and such. Okay. Um, so, and forgive me because I don't really truly understand how ENL works as, as a teaching tool, but do you uh, try to group um, specific languages within a school? Like we have a large Turkish, Turkish population, you're saying, do we send all the children who speak Turkish to one school or, or do we divide it so that there's? So no, not okay. exactly. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes it would be very convenient if we, if we had. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have teachers in our faculty that speak other languages. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be very convenient to think that we, it would be great to send a student there. There are many other factors that come okay. into place. Not just that, uh, Dr. Hirsch has talked to the principals about the size of the classes, specific grade in a school. If Slingerlands, Slingerlands right now in the first grade has a very big number of, of ENL students. So when we receive another first grader, we try to avoid adding to the, to the already overloaded case mm -hmm. in one school. So that's also another factor. Okay, understood. Thank you. Willa? Um, I did have two questions. I actually, I'm glad to hear that we don't try to group languages that way, just from a diversity perspective. I think that sounds um, like, a, like a better idea to share those students throughout the schools. Um, I was wondering about, I don't want to put you on this, I'm not going to put you on the spot, so I'm not going to say I don't want you to. I'm not going to. <laughs> Um, my question was going to be whether or not we had enough ENL specialists in each building. I don't need you to answer that, but in the event that we do not, <laughs> um, I hope that you would bring that to the board as part of a budget proposal. Um, I'm not clear whether any of these specialists are sharing buildings or traveling throughout the day. It sounds like a lot of student schedules to split um, very much the way special ed 
educators um, have to split their time and it feels like there's never enough of them. Um, so I will just make that a statement, not a question. And um, the students who are in commanding status, I think those are the students who, they stop receiving services but are sort of followed by the program. Is that what happens? It's a combination. We still see them. The teachers still have them in their classrooms, visit their classrooms, but they make determinations. Sometimes we can see a student more than the 18 minutes a day or 90 minutes a week because, by the way, commanding comes from something that I should point out. There are two ways of getting to commanding. You can score commanding on the nicest lap, and that would make you truly commanding, in my opinion. But there's, accountab there's an accountability option. The students that take the ELA three to eight test, if they score a three or a four, obviously, but if they score at least a three and then they also score expanding on the nicest slide, then the state has uh, established that that student becomes a commanding student. I don't know how we all feel about the ELA test, but I know that it's a multiple choice test. It doesn't measure speaking or listening, which are two crucial areas for language proficiency development in our opinion. So if, you, if a student is able to make the right guesses on the multiple choice, we could probably be looking at a student that is not truly commanding. Uh, so the teachers are the key at making those uh, determinations because, again, they see them every day and they, they know. Um, it's usually not the case, though, in Bethlehem. Our students do very well. They advance through the proficiency levels. I mean, they're, they're very well treated at home. They are comfortable in the classrooms. They're very well received. So in general terms, they make those advances truly, and then we're able to just see them with limited exposure uh, and not interrupt their day too much once they're proficient. And for those students that are at the elementary level, are they, do they, are they allowed to remain in the schools that they were moved to until they finish yeah, elementary I, school, I or so. do we shift them back to their home schools at that? I don't know that's the case, and, and I doubt that we would prefer to do that. I, I mean, once, right now we have one of the students, I was talking to Ms. Haas uh, today, and one of the students is moving to Ellesmere area. They've been at the school they're in for a while, so I was telling her, I would prefer that the student stays there. They already know the school culture, they're, if they feel comfortable, the student's doing very well, by the way, so uh, we try to make those efforts. Okay. We give love to our students. We don't give, we don't look at the numbers. We look at them. I was hoping that important. was the answer. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for the group that not only stayed for the night, but more <laughs> to, for the work that you do every day. I can, like, I think we only sort of understand what ENL specialists do on a daily basis, and it's just such a special population, and we really appreciate you guys. Thank you for your words, mm -hmm. and we could see how well they do. They were here. Uh, by the way, I will always agree with the statement that we need more ENL. <laughs> I will never disagree with <laughs> I Did just wanted to question? say thank you also, knowing how much time it takes to communicate with the families and the students, and it's not just the minutes that you teach in class, I'm sure they pop in and need your help in between, and so we appreciate all that you do, and we know that you work hard at it, so thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your Absolutely. presentation. Listen, I want to say, I, the pictures there. <laughs> it would be great if we could just see it. And I would feel so good that the students at least, you know, were honored. Uh, I'm sorry. We, I don't know what happened. We'd be happy to have you send it to us. You uh, certainly. Click uh, <laughs> refresh, please. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Great pictures. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to help your students, and it's adorable to see them in the classroom. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else to say. <laughs> yeah, certainly if anybody wants to come visit the school and spend some time in the classroom, uh, you know, see, see it in action, let us know. Well, I Thank that. you. I want to come. I <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I like that idea. I, I was thinking that the whole time. Like, Thank I you. Need to go to <laughs>
I'm going to pause for a minute so these guys can. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next on the agenda is recognition of public comment on an agenda item. If we have anybody who would like to address the board on an agenda item, now is the time. Item six, action items. Uh, A, finance action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following finance action items one through four. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. B, professional personnel action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following professional personnel action items one through six. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. C, support personnel action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following support staff action item one. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. D, other action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following action item number one. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. Um, e, the Capital Region BOCES board member election for 2023. Um, it is recommended by Capital Region BOCES that the Board of Education um, vote uh, on items one through four listed below as a slate to elect all four candidates on the ballot for board members of the Capital Region BOCES. So Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. Item F, the 2023-2024 Capital Region BOCES Administrative Budget. Um, it is recommended by Capital Region BOCES that the Board of Education vote to approve the following Capital District Board of Cooperative Educational Services Administrative Budget. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. Um, item seven, recognition of public comment on a non-agenda item. Um, at this time, if we have anyone who would like to address the board on a non-agenda item, now is the time to come forward. Uh, item eight, future meetings and events. Um, on April 24th at 6.30 p.m., we have a policy committee meeting at the high school. Um, on May 3rd is our next regularly scheduled board meeting and our hearing on the budget. Um, and we're anticipating that will start, uh, anticipating executive session at 6 and the regular meeting opening at 7.00. Um, May 10th at 6.30 will be the Meet the Candidates event, um, which my understanding is that will be virtual yep. through Zoom. Okay. So yes. information will go out about that. Um, on May 16th from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. is the annual budget vote and election um, in the high school gymnasium. And then on May 17th uh, is our the next board meeting after that, um, starting at 7, anticipating executive session at 6. I don't think there's any need to go back into executive session. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs>